random variables. So uh, a key key element of um, of uh, risk analysis is that we have these things we call variables, and their value is often uncertain. So hence the name random variables. Okay, a couple objectives for the class. We'll kind of give a little bit of a definition of what a random variable is, um, how they work and how they're used in risk analysis, how we describe them with probabilities, and then we'll talk about um, some of the different ways we can um, describe and characterize and model the uncertainty in our variables. And again, a variable could be any number of things, right? We talked a little bit about that yesterday. You know, it could be, um, you know, the, the, the risk estimate for a dam, right? The, the expected annual consequences would be a random variable. Um, you know, the, the uh, you, know, category, you know, categorical example, whether or not uh, you know, a flaw exists in our foundation would be a random variable. And then all the way through quantitative, right, the, the peak ground acceleration for an earthquake would be a, a, a random variable. Okay, so two main topics we'll cover here, random variables and their um, uncertainty. So what is a random variable? So a random variable who's, is, uh, is an event or, or um, parameter whose value is um, unknown or uncertain. So event-wise, you know, the question is, is, is what's, will the levy fail this year? Um, or a parameter, what's the, you know, what's the friction angle uh, of the uh, embankment soil? So again, you can probably think of hundreds of, hundreds of examples of things that are random variables that we um, deal with in, in risk analysis. So what do random variables do? It does uh, a key thing for us for risk analysis. It gives us a way to uh, map the events we're interested in a, in a risk analysis to some uh, measurable quantity or function in the realm of probability. So something we can, uh, we can measure, something we can define, something we can describe, and a risk estimate we can ultimately calculate. Um, so it gives us essentially a framework to calculate numbers that have meaning uh, in a risk analysis and meaning in a way that, you know, helps us to make um, risk-informed decisions. Two general types of random variables that I've touched on already. So they can be um, discrete. So discrete just means there's a finite or countable set of possibilities. So if we're talking about events, we're usually talking about outcomes. If we're talking about um, quantitative variables, we're talking about their values. So things like, you know, um, uh, you know, number of number of spillway gates or whatever it might be. Uh, continuous random variables have an infinite uh, number of outcomes, or if it's numerical, an infinite number of values. So. Um, Things like the, if you're estimating the capacity of a structure, right, there's an infinite number of possible values that we could assign to the capacity. And then the other, the other key thing we need to do with random variables is we need to tie them or link them up with probabilities. So for random variables, we um, talk about them uh, in two ways, right? We talk about their value or values, and we talk about um, what's the probability or likelihood of a particular value or a particular set of values um, for the random variable. So you always have those two things that go together when you're talking about random variables. What, what's the value of the variable and what's the likelihood that we will see that value? So just a couple simple examples here, probability of, an, of a uh, earthquake um, having an annual maximum PGA of between 0.4 and 0.6 G is 1 in 500. Um, conditional probability that we have an internal erosion failure given a flood that gets to the top of the levee and the probability of successfully evacuating the flooded area given um, that the population has received a warning. So 
again, lots of different examples and ways um, we can define and, and use um, random variables in a risk analysis. But again, the key concept is, you know, we're, we're not only assigning values to the variable, but we're estimating their associated probability. So one of the ways we can um, describe these probabilities for random variables is with probability distributions, which we'll touch on in more detail in a later lecture today. Um, but just to introduce the concept, the probability, and this is a little bit of a more formal definition, the probability distribution for a random variable is just a mathematical function uh, that gives us these probabilities that we're interested in, right? So again, it's a function that tells us what the relationship is between the outcomes or the values of the random variable and their probabilities. A uh, good term to know is, is the support um, for a probability distribution. So the support for a random variable and its associated probability distribution uh, is the set of all values uh, in the sample space that have some chance of occurring. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, that we'll, we'll see later when we talk about distributions, the log normal distribution. So in log space, you can't have um, values less than or equal to zero, right? So the support for a random variable that has a log normal distribution would be uh, that it can have any value uh, greater than zero, right? Uh, whereas if you have a normal distribution, a normal distribution is unbounded, right? It could have any value. So the, the support for a normal distribution is minus infinity to infinity. So knowing what the support is for a distribution can kind of help later on in terms of um, choosing distributions that might make sense for your data. And we'll cover some of that uh, in more detail later. So we talked about this a lot yesterday, um, and so this is just taking what we what we did yesterday and applying it um, in terms of random variables and their distribution. So we can summarize characteristics about random variables using some of the um, numerical and graphical concepts we covered yesterday, right? So we can talk about the range of possible values. We can talk about you know, typical values in terms of mean, median, mode. We can talk about the uncertainty um, in values in terms of variance, standard deviation, coefficient of variation. We can talk about the symmetry of values uh, in terms of skewness, and then we can do some of the summaries we've talked about that help us kind of understand the magnitude of the uncertainty in terms of using quantiles and percentiles and all the other things we covered um, yesterday. This is a key concept when it comes to random variables that applies to risk analysis. So any function, any mathematical function um, that contains random variables is also in and of itself a random variable. So um, this is a general format for the risk equation, at least the way we implement it in the core for dam and levy safety. So this is uh, the term on the left there is the expected value of consequences. So that's usually gonna be something like average annual life loss or expected annual damage or some other similar metric. And then the risk equation on the right is has three elements, um, and it's essentially an integral over those, um, those three elements. So this first term represents the hazard, so usually, you know, dam levy safety. This is flood and seismic hazards, but it could be any, any type of hazard. Um, and this represents um, kind of those uh, what I talked about in the earlier lecture with the total probability theorem, how we discretize, say, a flood hazard curve or a seismic hazard curve into discrete bins, right? Discrete magnitudes, that's represented by this first term. Second term is the response or capacity of the system. So essentially probability of failure given, given some magnitude of the hazard. Um, so we usually call those system response curves. And then this third term is the magnitude of the consequences given that we have um, whatever the response is that we're interested in, maybe it's failure and uh, and the magnitude of the hazard. So each of these each of these things on the right is going to be a random variable with some uncertainty. Now we can make choices in risk analysis on whether or not we want to explicitly model that uncertainty and include it in our risk estimate. 
But regardless, these three are all going to be random variables with some uncertainty. So because the, the annualized consequences are a function of those random variables, the annualized consequences themselves are also a random variable that will have uncertainty. And we'll talk about Monte Carlo as one of the key ways or one of the popular techniques we use to propagate the uncertainty through each of these elements in order to get an estimate of what the uncertainty is in the, in the risk. All right, so now we'll transition to talk a little bit about uncertainty. So um, uncertainty, there's two general types of uncertainty um, that are commonly referred to. You'll see these the, the two main bullets here, you'll see these terms used often in the literature. I'm not a big fan of them because I'm not a big fan of using fancy words, but um, they are the, the, the words you will see a lot. So aleatory and epistemic, and I think there's probably some, I'm not sure, Latin or Greek or some other root to these terms from which they're, you know, which is why those terms were chosen. But when you think about aleatory uncertainty, just think about it in terms of it being natural variability or inherent randomness or, um, or that sort of thing. So an example of natural variability would be that, um, let's say every year there's some you know, annual maximum flood event. Some years it's small, some years it's large right, and everything else in between. So in any given year, um, those floods happen randomly, or at least we model them as if they're random events. So for example, this year, we know there's going to be an max, annual maximum flood, but I, I can't tell you whether the largest flood we see this year is going to be a 10-year flood, a 50-year flood, or a 100-year flood, right? Um, I can't predict that. I can't guess what that's going to be. It's, it's just a random event, right? Some years it's going to be the 100-year flood, other years it's going to be the two-year flood. So we call that natural variability. Um, the other type is epistemic or knowledge uncertainty. So knowledge uncertainty comes from basically us either not having enough data, not having enough experience, not enough expertise, not enough understanding of, you know, whatever physical process we're trying to model um, so that can come from uncertainty in the data, uncertainty in our model, right? Because remember, all, all models are just approximations of reality. So maybe our, you know, there's uncertainty in how, how good our model is at representing reality and then the input parameters to our model. Um, you know, we don't necessarily know what the, what the right value is for those, right? So uh, an example of epistemic uncertainty would be um, Let's say we know um, we know that um, a hundred year flood could occur, and we're trying to estimate if if such a flood were to occur, what would the magnitude be right? What would the peak flow be or peak stage or uh, be? Um, and we estimate that based on past observations of flood events, right, and maybe some rainfall runoff modeling or whatever whatever we might do. So we have an estimate that you know a hundred year flood is going to be a stage of ten feet. Um, the key key concept to remember in terms of differentiating between these two types of uncertainty is that one is um, at least in principle reducible and the other one in principle is not. So aleatory uncertainty, we treat it as if it cannot be reduced or eliminated. So no matter how much we know we're never going to be able to predict, you know, when the next hundred year flood's going to happen. If we ever got to that point, you know, maybe someday we'll get to that point with, um, you know, AI and chat GPT and whatever else we come up with. Maybe someday we'll get there. But, um, and if we ever do get there, it'll make things a lot easier for us in terms of managing our safety programs. But for the time being, we can't do that, right? So we treat it as if it's irreducible and it's random. Epistemic, we assume that um, it is reducible. So we model it and we treat it as if, if we went out and did more work, we could reduce the uncertainty. So we can either go out and collect more data, we can make our model better, um, you know, we can do more studies to hone in on the values of the parameters in the model and so on and so forth. 
So um, that's the key distinction and, and the distinction and why we differentiate them in risk analysis really is because um, natural variability, we just have to treat it as random and or model it as random and knowledge uncertainty. We have choices to make as far as whether we're going to invest in more study to reduce it or go forth with the decision in light of the uncertainty that we have. Sorry. So again, this is more detail, same thing I just covered, right? So um, natural, and I, I prefer the terms natural variability and knowledge uncertainty, but you know you can use whatever, whatever term you like. Um, but again, it's uncertainty due to inherent randomness, and again, it's irreducible. Um, epistemic is due to lack of data or knowledge. In principle, it's reducible. And so, again, the question that comes up in risk analysis, and, and ultimately we'll see later why we care about knowledge uncertainty, is um, we can make decisions on whether to invest in reducing it. Um, different ways to express these different types of uncertainty. Um, oftentimes, we will separate them out, and again, um, you can get into some, I guess, some philosophical discussions where um, essentially risk and probabilities are uncertainty in and of themselves. So sometimes you'll have folks that will ask the question, well, when, when you separate it out, what does it mean to show uncertainty in the uncertainty? Um, but I think there's good reasons for it, and, uh, and I'll talk about them here on this slide in the next one. Um, so. The way we express natural variability in terms of its uncertainty is we usually express that in our estimate of probability and or risk. So things like annual probability of failure is a reflection of natural variability, right? If, if there was no natural variability, we would know if it was going to fail or not, and we wouldn't need probabilities. Same with expected annual damage, right? If we knew when the floods were going to occur, uh, the expected damage would be irrelevant because that's not what actually happens, right? Either a flood happens or it doesn't. Same with average annual life loss. So that's how we basically reflect natural variability in our risk estimates and use it to make decisions. Um, knowledge uncertainty, again, this is where it gets into the, the thing of showing uncertainty kind of in, in the uncertainty. So knowledge uncertainty can be expressed separately at, by showing an uncertainty in your risk estimate or in your probability. So you could show an uncertainty as a distribution um, in the estimate of the annual probability failure or as a distribution in the expected annual damages that is a reflection of the knowledge uncertainty. And again, why should we care? It's because those kinds of things can, um, can be useful for decisions uh, in, in at least two ways, which I'll cover here in the next slide. So here's what that looks like, right? So if you combine all the risk into a single risk estimate, you might get something like expected net benefits, expected annual damage, or whatever metric you're using, right? And that's a that's a single number. Um, or you can split out, usually we're only splitting out the knowledge uncertainty. You can split out the knowledge uncertainty and treat it separately. So in that case, you could show uh, an uncertainty distribution of your estimate of the net benefits, right, that reflects your knowledge uncertainty. So on the left, is a is non-exceedance probability versus um, annualized net benefits and on the right is the corresponding um, density function. So you can ask questions about the knowledge uncertainty with these types of outputs. For example, you could say, well, my expected net benefits is positive at 106,000 per year, but what's what's the chance, given my knowledge uncertainty, that I'm going to have negative net benefits, right? So you can you can look at the zero, zero point on here and get whatever that probability number is. Maybe it's 10 percent. Right? So, so you, you can say, despite all the work I've done, there's still a 10 percent chance that this project is going to be a bust. All right, and I'm going to lose money. Um, and then you can use that to to inform um, additional risk uh, additional types of risk informed decisions. And I'll give you two examples of of the types of decisions that can inform. First example is. Um, refers to the value of information. So this is what I mentioned earlier, where you talk about uh, a decision maker having to decide whether they want to invest in more study before making a decision, right? So you can you can say, well, okay, if I, if I spend more money and do more study to reduce the knowledge uncertainty, um, 
does that um, make it worthwhile in, t in terms of giving me a better chance of having positive benefits from my project? Um, so it really answers the fundamental question, am I, is it more effective to invest more in study or is it more effective to just make the decision given the information I have? So, um, so the key questions you want to think about there is, is additional study really going to add value um, to the decision and what's the chance that it's going to result in a different decision? And what are the impacts if that decision were to be different? The second type comes in to the, some of the ways decision makers make decisions. So um, there's two general types. There's actually a third type, but it, you, you wouldn't expect to see it ever in, in any sort of a safety program. So I'm not going to talk about it. So risk, risk neutral and risk averse. So basically risk neutral decision makers are making decisions off the expected value of the risk. Um, how big the uncertainty doesn't really matter all that much to them and whether or not the consequences are small or large doesn't matter. So let's, for example, if you're making a bet um, and you know your expected your expected win, you know, your expected win is a hundred dollars, but you have two different versions of that bet, right? One you could win or lose a thousand dollars and you know one you could win or lose a hundred dollars, right? Um, the risk neutral decision maker doesn't care as long as the expected value is the same. Um, the, contrast that with the risk averse decision maker. The risk averse decision maker cares about the uncertainty. So, given two options that have the same expected return, um, the risk averse decision maker is usually going to prefer the one that has less uncertainty, right? So, you could have two projects. Um, recall back the example on the earlier slide, two projects that have the same um, annualized net benefits, but if one has less uncertainty, in other words, a lower chance of having a negative annualized benefit, right, then the risk averse decision maker is going to pick the one that has less uncertainty. And they also often care about the magnitude of the consequences. So uh, what this means in terms of risk informed decision making is they're usually willing to pay more to avoid high consequences. So if you have um, you know, two two dams or two levees or two projects in your portfolio, and they both have the same uh, average annual life loss estimate, but one has the potential to have much higher consequences because it's a, a bigger dam or the levee area has more people in it or whatever it might be, then the decision maker who's risk averse is willing to make a larger investment in the levee or dam that has the higher potential consequences to try to avoid those those um, those outcomes. So that's a that's a quick introduction to to kind of how how uncertainty can tie in um, to decision making. Now there's other there's other ways and places where uncertainty is used, but these are two of the common ones. And this is really um, to me fundamentally why it makes sense um, to separate out the knowledge uncertainty, but not always, right? So don't don't worry about separating the uncertainty just for the sake of doing it. If you're going to do risk modeling and you want to separate the uncertainty, you should have a specific purpose and reason in terms of what kind of decision that's going to inform, right? If it's not informing a decision, then you're just doing extra math for the sake of doing math, right? So keep that in mind as you go forth in, uh, in the world of, of risk analysis. Okay, so that covers um, that covers that lecture. Anyone have any questions? Hey, David, this is Kevin Gers. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, on that risk neutral, uh, if they're caring about the expected, uh, what was it? The term they expected. Uh, mean or expected value? Yes. I assume that's the expected value of the risk estimate itself. Um, wouldn't that already incorporate some, in some way, magnitude of consequences since it's part of the equation? I'm, I'm not. I'm just trying to figure out how that kind of separates in that in those bullets. Yeah. So uh, I don't have a plot handy, but we'll see a plot of this on the last day. So if, if you're familiar with what 
commonly referred to as an FN plot. Yep. So imagine imagine a plot that shows our risk estimate where the vertical axis is probability of failure and the horizontal axis is consequences, and we show it as a point on the on the plot. Yep. So you could have a dam or a levy that has a um, high probability of failure and low consequences, right? And let's say that the annualized life loss estimate is something like 1 e to the minus 3, or 0.001. You could have another dam that kind of is the opposite of that, right? It has um, a very low probability of failure, but very, very high consequences. Mm -hmm. And when you combine those two, you could end up with the same annualized life loss estimate of, say, 1 e to the minus 3, right? So yep. from an expected value standpoint, right, those two risk estimates are identical. And so a risk, a risk neutral decision maker would not have any preference in terms of investing in one dam versus the other because they have the same risk, right? Whereas the, the risk averse decision maker might say, well, you know, I'm, I'm more worried about, even though it's less likely to occur, I'm more, more, more worried about an event that would have a catastrophic amount of life loss, right? Um, so I might prioritize that one first. I might also be willing to make a larger investment to reduce the risk of that one, um, even though they have the same risk estimate, right? I might want to drive that risk down lower because the consequences are so high. So that would be the risk averse version. Um, anyone that's familiar with tolerable risk guidelines, which I think we touch on just super briefly on the last day this week, um, the core's um, tolerable risk guidelines for both dams and levies um, are risk neutral. So um, our guideline on that FN plot is a diagonal line with a slope of negative one, which um, represents points that all have the same expected annual risk estimate. So, you know, we treat where you are relative to that line the same pretty much regardless of what the consequences are. So that would, that makes our guidelines risk neutral and makes our decisions risk neutral. The same thing is with two, like in planning studies for like um, economic investments. So, you know, um, net benefits, expected annual damage, all those types of terms and concepts, right? One of the core's primary metrics for selecting, uh, for selecting plans for planning studies is off of the expected return, right? We're trying to maximize the expected return our, on our investment as one of our primary, not our only objective, but one of our primary objectives. So again, we don't we don't favor one plan over another because the consequences are different, right? If they have the same expected return, we roughly treat them the same. Does that help? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Yep. And there's whole college level classes on decision theory that go into this stuff way deeper than we ever could in this in this amount of time. But those things are out there, and um, I always tell people too, like YouTube and Google and things like that are all your friend. You can find tons of additional information if you're inclined to go down the rabbit hole on any of these topics. 